Hello! Hi there. Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where we are not not out big about all things small. My name is Danny, and in a previous life I dropped off my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC, dedicated to enabling the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and in a previous life I got my PhD in microbiology from Imperial College of London, and where amongst other things, I was making flesh-eating bacteria glow in the dark. And since then, I've worked as a research integrity specialist, and these days I'm an editor for an academic journal. Every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today it's our deep dive week, where we uh, look at each figure in a paper that we chose last week and criticize the scientific findings. This is a journal club, and we encourage our audience to leave us questions and comments. Next week will be our news week, where we survey a bunch of articles and choose an article for the next deep dive. So make sure to subscribe to satisfy your microbiology curiosities. You can follow along with the papers that we discuss on either week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly doobly. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet at us using the hashtag microTWJC hashtag. And so this week, we're talking about microfluidic chips provide visual access in situ soil ecology. So um, so this one is where they basically like using a microscope to see how the soil behaves, I think. It's quite... We select yeah. this because like, it was quite interesting. They, they have like so they have this thing where they create this microfluidic chip. Um, so let me pull that up quickly so that, that everyone... So yeah. So essentially this is some, something that etch into this material called PDM... Uh, oh, I already... PDMS. PDMS. <laughs> uh, yeah. And creating essentially... Polydimethyl silicate. It's sort of like... Um, it's like a softer... It's a, it's a type of glass, I suppose. Maybe like a plasticky sort of glass. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, it's like it's meant to be softer than your average glass, which is a weird thing. Mm -hmm. I, I just cannot imagine how that material will feel like or what it's like. But <laughs> but it is very smooth, right? I think I and this is mm. important too because um, in the in the study is essentially trying to replicate structures or shapes that you might see inside of soil, like tiny shapes and, and passageways that you would see in soil, but replicate it in this microfluidic device. And so it comes with all the limitations that the material that they're making it out of is not exactly the same material as soil, but they hope to still learn something useful about the biology by replicating these types of abstract shapes, generalizable shapes. Yeah, I think mm. we should talk a little bit about the, the model of the soil, because it's not something that I'd have really thought about, because the soil, I just think of like a mm. block of stuff. But they kind of treat it as yeah. like a network of caverns and tiny things at a micro. So it's more like Fraggle Rock, like like that's. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I think that's exactly that's a really good way to think about it. And really, it makes sense because you have to think at the scale of the organisms that you're studying, right? So when we're thinking about um, bacteria that are like microns across, features that are right submicron level. Um, or micron level features, like those become giant, right? Those are the size of the whole body form. Um, and then also at that scale, uh, things behave differently, right? Like water surface tension is actually really powerful mm. at that scale, right? Like um, if you have an air bubble, like getting through the barrier between the water and the air for a really small microbe is a lot of work. Um, but there are there are different scales of organisms, even within the soil, right? Like you get things like nematodes mm. or fungi, and those are maybe a little bit bigger than the scale of bacteria. And so they'll be able to move through those types of barriers even easier. Oh, yeah. Tardigrades, right? Yeah. Uh, earthworms, now we're getting bigger than, than that as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, from the perspective <laughs> of bacteria, like a nematode is like the kind of sandworm from Dune where it just bashes through the soil. And <laughs> I mean... Yeah, right. I mean, I think that's a really good point to say as well, like a nematode, which we can't even see with our, we can't see those with our naked mm. eye, right? Like those are t a bit too small. Maybe we can see like the trails sometimes they make, we can barely see them, but their, their guts are lined with bacteria, right? That's a whole ecosystem, uh, just a nematode. So when we're talking about soil, if we look at it, it's just like brown stuff, right? Like a, a lump of crumbly brown things. But think about how many nooks and crannies are in that, right? I think everyone has that vision of soil right you can compress soil down mm -hmm. right like a, you have like a handful of soil you can make like a a soil a mud <laughs> ball out of it and there's way less volume because you've pressed all the spaces yeah. out of it right there's a lot of space inside of soil and the shape of that space is going to be this 
tortured sort of like network of different spaces. Yeah, yeah. and that's kind of what this chip is trying to simulate with all the different interconnected caverns mm-hmm. that might be filled with different bacteria. And this kind of paper is trying to look at, so it puts this chip in the soil and sees how the bacteria, fungi, and other microbes in the soil enter into it and how they colonize it. <laughs> and and so it's, it is like, a I guess, a roach motel for bacteria or something like that where... <laughs> like this, ob- yeah. or even this, I, I think of an obstacle course for the bacteria to to see how they'll behave. Uh, and I'm not just talking about bacteria here, yeah. but fun- I th- fungi and everything. Any any microbe in the soil, yeah. right, is going to have entrance into this this artificial system. I think of it as a hamster hamster gymnasium, yeah. right? Like lots of tubes and like kind of interesting features. Um, and yeah, as you said, made from made using the techniques of microfluidics. Yeah. And we touched on that topic a little bit before, uh, especially when talking about single cell sequencing or screening through um, individual bacteria for different compounds. Right? These are really tiny features that get etched into this material, a smooth glass-like material. Uh, you can etch very tiny features. Um, and they have chosen these features based on what they think are the range of spaces that you could encounter inside of soil. <laughs> right. Uh, so I think we'll move on to the, like the next picture, which kind of shows. So it shows a little picture of what this actually looks like, and like how they yeah. treat it. So there's one one point where they just went out to some woods. I think it's somewhere in Sweden, and they buried it in the soil and left it for a couple of months. Uh-huh. And then and here you can <laughs> kind of see their desk where they just put some soil like granules onto it and let the bacteria or microbes from the soil enter into the chip and th- using that they can actually visualize everything in real time or in, in outdoors yep. you kind of have to you can't see everything because you've left it outside so um yep there are of course pluses and minuses and uh they also mention that the chips they do some after they make all the channels in the chips you can have them dry mm. but you could also fill them with liquid and so they also uh they have like different experimental conditions they can use on the chip. They could fill the, the chip with water or they could fill the chip with media. I think they use like a malt media. Yeah. Uh, and you can imagine that that's going to change the types of things that want to move in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned before, air is a big barrier because a bubble is hard for, for many microbes to like break through that meniscus. Uh, and if mm-hmm. it's like water, then that will be some, a different thing. And if it's malt, then that might promote the growth of certain things that so it all changes like kind of the, the, so we're going to see what how that affects what microbes can enter where and what kind of things it's simulating yeah. within the soil because again we in the soil it's a mix of spaces that are filled with like water or air pockets or so we're going to get a mix of everything yeah and so i i guess maybe we'll just um before we before we leave some of this introductory stuff Oh, I guess no. Actually, no. Keep yeah. Going. So we've got like introductory the, another. Yeah. So this is part of their proof of concept because they want to show, make sure that their channels simulate the soil. So they check for minerals entering into the the soil. So here they're looking at some quartz granules that have entered into their channels that were, after they put it into the soil. So this is a Ray, Raymond scattering graph, I think, where they kind of mm-hmm. point light in it and see what reflects back, and it kind of gives a rough idea of what's in there. So you've got like PDMS, and you've got like lots of quartz coming in, and quartz is one of the most common like kind of minerals in the Earth's crust, so that's a, mm-hmm. that's a good indication that your soil is getting in. Yeah, I think it also speaks to the fact that even though they built these channels with these abstract shapes, they're they're also getting complexity from the uh, dissolved or dissolvable abiotic components yeah. of the soil that that infiltrate this. So it's not just that they've made like a cool zigzag pattern that they think bacteria would want to navigate. Um, it, it's also that that pattern means that different um, particles of, of soil itself are going to diffuse in and find get, get caught in like some nook and cranny, right? accumulate in certain areas. Um, and that is also something that might be happening in the soil structure itself. Like these are all, in some ways, it's just like a smorgasbord of uh, possible scenarios that you could encounter in the soil. And they get to actually look at it through a microscope and say what's going on (laughs) right and so that brings us to figure one which is a really big thing we're going to be delving into each of the the side panels individually but essentially this this shows like kind of the big picture of what's going on on each each level of the chip um 
So I think... Yeah, so here's the smorgasbord of all the different shapes. In the center, they have... That's the... Um, that's, I guess, what they're going to be zooming into, right? All these different areas of the chip. And then the soil was placed uh, at the bottom of that chip. And uh, lets it, so the bottom of the chip is left open. Yeah. And so whether the soil is placed there or the chip is placed in the environment, that's the entry, <laughs> the lobby, <laughs> where all the creatures can start to gather and then find their way into the more complicated structures um, of the chip. <clears throat> yeah. And so... Yeah, I guess we're going to start off with the first part, which is like the starting of the micro, the micro habitat formulation. So the initial stages of how how the soil gets colonized, and so you've got this water mm -hmm. meniscus that forms. Uh, this is our first video that uh, you can see some bacteria move around it, but essentially they've got these like pillars, and in between them, water can link them, and that can all. So you can see like kind of the bits of soil aggregate like being sticking to the those. Being stuck together because of the water and little bits of bacteria yep. kind of floating around in it yeah and it's uh i guess so this is like this in this um in this instance the the chip hasn't really been full the chip is not fully flooded, oh, yeah. right this is moisture from the environment percolating through these structures and just that whatever natural moisture right is in the soil or in the ground or in the sample that they place that's enough moisture that it creates droplets um and so this gives you a sense of like how dynamic like soil can be as water levels right soil can get dry and it get moist right and you get these like um i guess waves waves of moisture that come through that can bring in all sorts of different stuff aggregates bacteria but then it can also leave them stranded all of a sudden right when some of it kind of evaporates away and you only get like some of the water being stuck to the pillars so i think this is like an important uh it's already known right like people know that this happens mm. in the soil but what they're showing us in this picture, why they even published this right paper, is that they can now replicate that feature in in a lab with this with this particular pillar structure. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and then they've got uh, connect connectivity dynamics. So the kind of the mm -hmm. way the so the idea that they these like bits these like water channels can form like networks through which like kind of you can transfer soil particles and uh the other such, such stuff so got a nice video here you can s scroll up we can see like various like soil particles accumulating across this pipe um yeah yeah this is this is kind of this is wild to me because um it sort of implies that if you have these tiny little if you have tiny little passageways water is going to flow and if the water is going to flow through those passageways they're going to bring it's going to bring stuff with it um, and so this is that model, right? Of, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that I think it's, it's probably by capillary action that the water moves through these, these spaces. Um, and yeah, so it's just like the presence of small spaces, water will go through there and potentially deposit stuff in its path. Yeah. I mean, as someone who just did his plumbing this morning, this very much is, <laughs> Very, I, I can confirm this, and this, uh, this happens, that water can transport all <laughs> sorts of stuff into the weirdest nooks and crannies. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then we've got, like, so now we've got this microhabitat forming, you've got, like, preferential flow paths. So uh, essentially, like, kind of, the idea is, like, these like, meniscuses can link up, and they can form, like, paths where, like, things can flow and in this image they particularly highlight the fact that fungi are growing growing and the fungi themselves start to form this barrier so that's indicated by the h mm. um h for hyphae yeah h I guess. for hyphae right. hyphae are what fung so, fungal networks are made from yeah oh yeah good yeah fungal networks are made from like uh fungi they yeah they, they can live as single cells that just float around but as they get bigger they start to branch out they send these hyphae out um they're essentially long strings of sometimes only a single cell yeah. right like they're not always multiple cells but they can be multiple cells as well yeah <clears throat> uh so hyphae are going to be very important important in like the soil community because fungi are just uh and we're going to see like why in this paper so this is going to start with a hyphal barrier of particles as well where you can see here that particles like are being blocked off by this hyphae and they're accumulating around it which is mm -hmm. good for the fungus because the fungus wants to have nutrients around it um 
I do. I, I want to say at this point, um, people might be familiar with this term, the rhizosphere, mm. right? It's it's a section around the roots of plants, right? That uh, because plants are secreting interesting compounds to try to encourage uh, their favorite bacteria or their favorite fungi to grow in that space, and thus like be able to absorb nutrients and things like that. I, people may have heard that term mm. before, um, and it's related to this paper in the sense of like here are fungi, right, doing their thing, right, creating uh, networks to try to uh, grab nutrients, but restricted in some physical space. You could imagine that maybe these pillars are root fibers or something, right? Of course, like root fibers are secreting compounds that like encourage a certain type of growth, but this is that abstractness that they're bringing to the paper, right? The model system part of it, where it's like, what about just the shapes themselves, the way they restrict space? We may be able to see um, certain types of structures forming and say, okay, that's that's a really useful thing for a plant to want around. This is why you know things are shaped this way in nature. Um, so yeah, I just want to point that out that in it, this could also be. Like soil, this is an, a model of soil, but soil across the entire world has all sorts of weird shapes. And they're sort of trying to find like, where could these stories be applicable? And then um, demonstrate to other researchers that you could follow up and learn something more by using these shapes, right? And th this model in some way. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, it's talking about the role of like fun fungi in the microsphere. Uh... We've got this idea of passage opening. So they've got these diamond-shaped passages where uh, that they have, mm -hmm. and what they found in like some of them was that apparently that the fungi had started to burrow. Um, so on, oh, no. so you can sort of see they're gonna they're gonna show it in a second. This, but yeah, in like one corner of this, uh, you can see like the yeah. the the hyphae have started to burrow and find new sections. So it's kind of like got the. So I guess like the the sandworms, they've got this like environmental like manipulating part of it, the way they can dig in the soil and find new areas. Um, so this must be between this this burrowing must be between the PDMS and the glass cover soil, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like um, we saw we saw all the shapes that they made that was etched in the uh, PDMS, but uh, on top of that they placed glass so that then they can look through mm. it. And here it would be like, okay, so the fungi are happy to move down like narrow tunnels, but they find an opening and maybe their behavior changes in some way or there's some some physical thing that in when they're in that open space, they seek some sort of, they're seeking for cracks. Mm. And then they find a space like in between the glass cover slip and the chip and then they grow into it. Um, so yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. It's like, you can imagine these types of, diamond shapes being present right inside of soil right there's a little opening in the soil well maybe fungi in that space they behave in a certain way again yeah. this is all just they're just looking at these pictures after the fact right and saying does this tell us something about what happens in soil because they don't have these types of images it's it's more difficult to get this type of image from soil itself because you don't have that control when you, let's say you fix a block of soil, mm. right? You're able to permeate it with some sort of fixative. I think people do this. They permeate with a fixative and then they do thin slices. I think um, in the paper they call that like 2D section, right. right? You take 2D sections of soil. What's the chances that you're going to find these types of abstract shapes, right? Where you want them, right? With the organisms that you're interested in. Soil is such a big place, full of organisms, full of spaces this methodology that they're using is uh, abstracting out right those spaces and then giving us an opportunity to see them in isolation and re reproducible reproducibly as well potentially yeah i mean you because if you like you can potentially theoretically do the same if you look like a rotting tree trunk you can try to skim through but you, this gives you the opportunity to actually see like the before and after whereas with those uh, kind of 2d slices you just get a snapshot of what at one point in time and and mm -hmm. you don't get the control of having like you can't repeat that experiment on something that's exactly the same soil because the structure of every single bit of mm -hmm. soil will always be slightly different so this is where this kind of standardized chip comes in where you can re rerun the same experiment and see whether the fungus would behave in the same way yeah and i guess the other interesting thing about this particular set as as we're saying about reproducibility and stuff is they're using this random complex sample of of organisms mm -hmm. 
they don't necessarily know what organisms are, what no. they are here, right? Like. Uh, it's possible that we're looking at things that aren't previously cultured as well because they're using right like this mix of Whatever's in the soil. Maybe there's things that grow here because of the shapes and because of the way that the nutrients diffuse um, That have never been seen before and they didn't follow up on that uh, in the span of this paper But that's something to keep in mind as well. They do point to we talked about that eye chip mm. technology is microfluidics technology that allow people to grow right uh, bacteria that they haven't previously been able to grow. And part of the feature of that is those tiny spaces that concentrate uh, molecules in a different way, right? Because in each of these little diamond spaces, uh, whatever that fungi is making is getting concentrated in that local environment. Right. Um, and those could be signals, right? Those could be growth could factors for different types of organisms. We just yeah. don't know. It's wild somewhere. Um, yeah, you, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. It could, be, it could even be antibiotics and we don't know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. next one is habitat fragmentation. So this is another thing that uh, is kind of an important. So here's, here's a video of basically like the fungi have, have blocked up the passage completely. So these bacteria mm -hmm. are now trapped in this little <laughs> little square and they can't get out. Um, so that's creating its own like microhabitat that is almost like yeah the 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 fungi is in in, in control of that. That's right. They're the walls. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're the they're dividing up the the rental space. <laughs> yeah. They're, like last one, they're creating more rental space here. They're kind of segregating. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's horrible. Uh, I mean, they're this they're they're blocking off access and they're. they're yeah. yeah, no, they're making the subunits. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so that's... so, And the, the third part that fung fungus do is they, they create these fungal highways. So uh, in areas that are very dry, moisture clings to the surface of the fungi. So actually what happens is you find these droplets forming around the fungi that are just teeming with bacteria. So... Oh, in this video you can really see the bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can... <laughs> You can definitely see that, and you can sort of get how reliant the bacteria are on on the fungi at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think uh, this this is something that comes up in their discussion a little bit as well, right? Where uh, the surface properties of fungi, right, in this environment are obviously like their presumably their natural surface properties, but the surface property of the surrounding area is it might not be. Mm. <laughs> Right, that this PA, PMDS, like uh, it's either 100% covered in water or it's like not covered in water at all. There's not like a damp, right? Dampness, I think, is like a difficult thing to figure out in this environment. Yeah. And um, because, like, if you think about soil, it's like they're kind of it's like spongy, mm. right? Like there's like uh, it's all organic material that might form that surface. So the relative importance of these phenomena that they see, I think is hard to understand uh, because 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 the environment is artificial, uh, it's hard to say like if they see more instances of certain things happening versus others, whether that's being driven by the fact that all the materials are just like um, uh, arbitrary, right, materials, right. or it's some other feature. But um, if they see these phenomena, they are things that could happen in the soil, right? Like these phenomena are, uh, possible that this could happen and if you could imagine the the space that it could happen in uh, then this might be a micro environment where where certain types of soil bacteria live um, and I think that's a, another important point as we continue to go through this list of examples is that soil has we soil is one of the most complex environments we know that there's so much stuff that lives in soil but we don't know when those particular things, all that different stuff actually grows. There, there's this thought that like things lie dormant in soil waiting for their moment. Mm. <laughs> um, and and this, this type of investigation is also helping us break apart those moments, if you will, in time where a certain bacteria might have an advantage and thus start to grow and, and take its chance. Yeah. Right, so I think that's another thing that we can think about as we look through all these images. That you can think of these as some moment, <laughs> right? Uh, a particular confluence of physical conditions. Um, 
both from the biotic and the abiotic that might let a bacteria grow or yeah. a microbe take advantage of. Yeah, yeah. I think like we, we have to always <laughs> remember that in order to make, for, to make this a good experiment, they had to make sure that those things were that the chips were sterile when they put in. But actually, in the soil, mm -hmm. you, you rarely see a sterile environment, except in like certain right. in the earliest stages. If you've got like a desert that is being colonized or something, some other. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is simulating kind of a very like early stage of soil formation that you wouldn't usually see potentially. But I think right. like, in terms of forming the building blocks of our understanding of how soil works, I think this is a good starting point because of that. Yeah, uh, but like. Um... The reason why, so the, one of the pe reasons why people say soil is so complex is because upon disturbance, right, when the soil gets disturbed in some way, that opens up some of these niches that haven't been previously mm. filled. So, like, in some ways, that's how we can think of this model as well, right? Like, it's like the post-disturbance. The disturbance is abstract, though, right? Like, it's the absence of life yeah. is, is what the disturbance is. But the, the types of things that are moving in these are the types of things that could move in in something that's probably more grounded of a disturbance in, in I mean, the environment. But we just don't have I that I guess thought. the equivalent is, like, if you're a gardener, turning the soil to oxygenate it or to, like, or if you're putting, that changes the, that increases the aeration of soil, more air pockets. And then the question is, how do yep. the, I mean, how does that change? How do the microbes respond to that? And th this is kind yeah, of like absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely. How do those air pockets get settled afterwards? Yeah. And, and I think you don't even have to think of it from the gardener perspective. You can just say that like a giant worm is like burrowing through the soil. Yeah. And for a microbe, that is that that air pocket that gets formed from the worm going through is yeah. huge. Like they're never going to be able to span that gap. So yeah, I think that's like, it's good to think about we have to always, um, for this paper, I feel like it's so important to like say like what exactly is being studied here, right? Because it's such a weird artificial object, but uh, they, the fact that they can show us all these different features is actually part of the excitement about it. Because, oh wow, like look at this weird thing that happened. Like you can imagine the case it would happen in the soil and then start to build some hypotheses and say, well, we can reproduce it over and over again in this system. Now we can study it, where we have previously not been able to study something like this. <clears throat> yeah. So fungal highways, fungal. a potential, right, a potential thing that happens inside of soil. <laughs> yeah. And the final bit is passive destruction, where you've got this giant nematode worm that is unfortunately uh, trapped completely because of these <laughs> fungal hyphae that have like. Uh, blocked off its pa mm -hmm. passages for exit or entry, which actually is uh, actually no, it may be obstructed. I'm not sure because again, that begs the question of like, how did the nematode one get in there if it was completely hemmed in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Was it was it just hanging out in this space that had everything it needed, and then all of a sudden it got surrounded? Does it have a mechanism to poke through the hyphae if it wants? Right, we don't know this type of yeah. stuff necessarily. I mean, I. Um, but I don't believe that the hi-fi grew faster than the nematode worm could move. So either it had been sat there for a while, watching the, watching all the entrances and exits get like grown over, or it has some way to push through. But that's but that's what I oh. think. Like I, I I would think that it could one of its everything it needs everything the nematode needs is in that space. Right? And it, it never needed to move out of it. It migrated in, and it was like, this is a great space. I'm going to stay here. Man, uh, I've never empathized so hard with a nematode worm before. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then when it tried to use the door, it realized it was sealed shut by Hyphae. <laughs> oh, good. Is that what's going to happen with lockdown? I'm going to kind of open my door and see, like, a fungus growth. Just I'll be like, oh, oh, I, I'm the nematode worm here. <laughs> Um, I guess another thing is I'm not really sure how fast nematode generation time is, but it, could, it sensibly could have been born in this location, right? A seed, right? Uh, an egg could have been pushed into this True. space and then it could have hatched. Uh, that's another possibility. Mm -mm. But, yeah. Uh, so, but it, it obviously, uh, if, if that's the case, then there would definitely have to be enough nutrients in this space, um, to just like have it live. Yeah. Right? Like that, that would be a feature. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think that that uh, mostly like kind of paints a story of how like fungi are the microsphere as I think they're calling here are ruling mm -hmm. this the space. I think now we're going to be moving into like the web, food web dynamics. So we're going to start what seeing like how various other organisms live here. And I think this next one is of, of various 
uh, protests like hunting each other. So mm-hmm. you've got like some protests would just have like eaten some bacteria. Um, so you, yeah. yeah, you see like one little guy who's just wandering around, wandering about. There are two. There's... Yeah, if it's hard for people to see in the gray, you can look at that color diagram. It kind of they try to show us what the different components are, right? There's two microfauna, which are the protists that we're talking about. One is some sort of amoeboid thing, and the other one is some sort of uh, flagellate, ciliate, or no, flagellate probably, because yeah. it has like a single... I can see there's a single thing poking out of it that it's moving. Yeah, it's got a little <laughs> noodle that's, that it uses to pull itself forward. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what they're showing us here is that these um, larger organisms, they're helping form this environment by pushing particles around, <laughs> right? They, they push things around. They can be the force. It might not always just be water flow that's bringing objects to where they, need, where, where they end up settling. It's also the action of these organisms, like churning stuff around. <clears throat> And then dying as well, right? Yeah. I think that that's another uh, uh, important thing to remember. And they, they use this term in the paper. They call it necromass <laughs> for, like, biomass. And they say necromass. That idea that, like, yeah, you know, you might live your whole life in this little zone as an organism, and then you die. You become part of the environment then, right? Your biomass is now, like, that's uh, that's a re- that's a um, that's the new playground or that's the new like uh, empty apartment building, right. right? Where bacteria can move in and other organisms can start pushing that around and moving it into new locations. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, that brings us to the next, the, the final part of this particular figure, which is foraging behavior where we believe, I believe we see like one of those, uh, a couple of like bacteria running around and being ch- and chasing mm-hmm. each other. So they, there's like two that seem to be like following each other and like yeah they're just one running around like trying to get food particles and i think actually they're also show i think it's also important to look at the the microfauna in this one right that one's uh, near the right hand yep. side and it's like it's engaging with these particles in a way that i think is uh, what the authors are trying to say is, is a feeding behavior yeah. um <clears throat> So uh, this maybe adds some interest to this particular chip molecule or this particular chip model, because what if we want to understand uh, the behavior of these types of microfauna, right? Um, there's actually a really great YouTube channel called Journey to the Microcosmos. Mm. I don't know if people have seen that channel before, but uh, it essentially like the person in that channel is looking at things like this. They don't have... Uh, um, a microfluidics chip to make like these interesting spaces. They put like some hay or some fibers right down on the surface of the slide, and then that creates the small little trap spaces uh, where that they can observe these organisms. And essentially, what the authors are saying here is, you can make like repeatable uh, structures that uh, you could isolate uh, this type of behavior in. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, can we just go back and look at the the big grid of all the things to yep. try to <laughs> take some holistic view of what's going on here? Um, so, like, I think what you said, the dominance of the mycosphere is like a really important point to take away from seeing all of these instances. They want to really, the authors want to emphasize the fact that uh, hyphae really m- modified the spaces heavily. <laughs> when the scale is this small, hyphae are like these moving walls yeah, <laughs> and, and moving construction things that can segment spaces, can bridge spaces, uh, can bridge spaces, dry spaces to moist spaces, can trap microfauna and like create spaces where they can own only some micro like segregate the, the different types of microfauna from each other. Um, and that's almost, and that's like in combination with, uh, just like the crud, the, yeah. the, the, the particles and the minerals that get pushed around, uh, both those things really form uh, a dynamic, sort of they make the space more dynamic, even though that you have these static things. I mean, in this example, they've designed static things, and yet they get this dynamic formation of different spaces uh, based on both the abiotic and the biotic elements. 
Uh, and then finally they kind of wrap it up and they say, and within this space, like you have these life dramas being played out, right? Like this is, this is the Savannah yeah. <laughs> where you're like following the tigers and the lions and being like, yeah, like, do we see this behavior in other systems? I don't know. Right. But the authors want to, are excited to share with us, um, their, their promise that, if more people start looking at this and and segmenting things and maybe categorizing things, we may find discoveries in soil that we previously haven't been able to see. I think that's like the big thrust of this right. paper, right? Is like, what is the usefulness of making tiny channels and putting soil in them? Well, here are some of the things that we were able to see um, get interested, right? Like, let's get people interested in using this tool. <clears throat> yeah, and now it was always gonna happen, but now we bring in a graph. Mm -hmm. where they, the main focus of the graph I think is to look at the, they've got like three different channels one's like a zigzag one's more square and one's very much like it goes back on itself it's I don't know how to describe it it looks like uh, well, they, they call it a Z a Z right? yeah they, they, they call them Zs so they're like mirrored Zs <laughs> yeah and they basically try to look at how how far along the colonization happens so it's almost like a race to see like which which mm -hmm. goes further f first? Would it be the fungi, the bacteria, or protists? And in which area yep. do they do best? So uh, yeah, they have three different uh, things that these channel types could be filled with. It could be filled with uh, air, water, or malt, malt which is like a, a media, <laughs> like a bacterial media. Yeah, it's got like sugars and stuff that peep that bacteria can grow on. And I think like mm -hmm. the I think the top one is uh, in the wild. And the bottom one is in the lab. Uh, yep. <clears throat> right. So uh, what we kind of find is that the fungi tend tend to do a lot better. Like that. Well, you see how I can interpret this quickly. Because uh, they seem well, to do very well in the in the zig uh, for uh, thing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They love the zig. They love the zig. <laughs> or or they or right, no, it's how far they yeah. get right. So they they. The zigs let them go further. That angle, I guess, like isn't some sort of like stop signal for them. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm assuming they measure like the actual, like total distance of the z zig, because otherwise, like if they're just like mm -hmm. uh, measuring like how far up they get up in total, then actually the square has has more distance that the fungi has to travel. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think that they they measure the dis yeah the actual channel distance, yeah. not how far up they get. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that might make sense. You know, like this is this is behavior actually mm. in many ways that they're they're looking at. They're looking at fungal behavior, and they're saying that when you give fungi ninety degree or greater bends, <laughs> they don't the hyphae don't necessarily want to go up those um, those passages at least in air, right? Yeah. But once you add some liquid in, they're more likely to go down those passages. Um, yeah. yeah, so they're basically like like Priuses. They can't turn a corner very well. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, yeah. uh, and once you start like adding in water and malt, suddenly the bacteria and protists do a lot better because. So yeah. I I think that I mean the malt is kind of interesting because that's something that is almost made for bacteria to grow in. Um, mm -hmm. So I get the impression it seems like. This, it outcompetes the fungi in that sort of way, it, whereas like the fungi are doing much better in air than everything else. Um, yeah, but I mean, there's still like there's no, I don't see any big difference between the fungi, like how far they colonize versus the bacteria and the protists. Mm. Oh, I see, I see, because malt, right? I know, I see what yeah. you're saying now. No, you're right. Yeah, like in in malt, fungi don't really move down those passages. Yeah, but I guess in malt, that means those passages are already filled with fluid. So you've got bacteria who are already quite motile, and they they can they can make it much further. Um, I mean, that's I, I, to me this is this is also preference, hmm. right? Because there's something in the fungi that is choosing to make the decision: Do I send a hyphae d down this passage? Hmm. And it when when the passage is waterlogged. It sounds like the fungi are like, nope, don't need to go down that passage. They they don't want to go somewhere that's like fully entrenched in water. Well, I mean, I, I think the because it's weird because in the malt the malt like kind of when you're looking at just the fungi in the wild the malt the the water mm -hmm. and the air 
are very very similar in the z- in the zig uh, formation, and water yeah. kind of seems to help it in the square formation. So uh-huh. uh, I think the malt. I mean, the thing is this. But in the wi- in the wild version, malt the fungi are going down the malt. Yeah, side. that's true. <laughs> but not in the water and the air, right? Like, is it really something about water and malt, or is it more like it's that organism? <laughs> <laughs> whatever organisms that they're seeing because right? yeah. we also this is so super broad we may be looking at different fungi in these two scenarios right and they're just grouping it all together and saying hyphae but like it's diverse like there's all sorts of reasons why one could imagine right yeah uh both from the stance of is it a better environment for that organism but also is it the organism that would move into that type of space Right, we have to also think True. about that like, level. Because <laughs> uh, the level of, uh, of ident- microbial identification is they look down a microscope and go, that looks kind of like a fungus. So I guess that, yep. that's it. <laughs> that looks like a bacteria. Guess it's a bacteria. Uh, so this isn't right. like the most like analytical of papers in that respect. This is very much like, we. this is our best guess from what we can look at under a mic- microscope. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. guess like we don't want to like look too deeply into these graphs i think uh i'm right right i think they should be they're more like springboards for different hypotheses but they'd have to be followed up in a certain way uh in order to say something uh more concrete uh especially when we're saying things like competition between bacteria and fungi right or like right the likelihood of going down um i mean i think to me the strongest thing is when you see nothing going down like that's that's actually really mm. useful <laughs> information right because it's like that's something where even like for example protus in air between the lab and the and the and the natural environment they don't want to go down those no. passage passageways right there's nothing for them there right they, they'll get dried out they need they need moisture to move down those passages um right, right. like you want to see these like stronger stronger signals and try to interpret the strong signals uh the the weak signals are the ones that are a bit convoluted those are harder to interpret in this case because you're working with so many variables <clears throat> right so that brings us to the next set of movies which are looking at the micro microbial succession in in air mm. water and malt so how do so you've got these spaces that have air water and malt in them how do the the microbes kind of settle into them so, uh, yeah. and we kind of see the, this weird sense of succession where, um, where like in malt you see like there's lots of variation, lots of different like granules appear, uh, and with um, air, it, so it it's kind of weird to interpret. So I've got like the supplementary figure three, which shows the same data but uh, with that's nice, yeah. To see the time lapse in it <laughs> more clearly with with the with the times associated. <clears throat> yeah. So I'm what I I think I'm seeing is that the the malt gets much more diverse much more diversity because you get like hypha, bacteria, and protists, but the hypha don't mm-hmm. seem to last very long in them. Uh, mm-hmm. And with air, you just get air bubbles in them, and with uh, the water, you get well. Oh no, the I, I think the bubbles that that's condensation. Right. That's moisture. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a wave of moisture like appearing in the dry spot. <clears throat> yeah, so you just get it slowly filling up with water. Um, so this kind of illustrates, I think, the like the process and also kind of the messiness of this process because like what we what you didn't get from those graphs was that oh, I think they looked at a certain time point and some and in between that you could have like things like five foot appearing and then disappearing like fungi can. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's really clear in C, right? Like lots of places, lots of these organisms want to investigate, right, a space mm. that has nutrients in it, but they are not necessarily going to stay in that space. Right. Um, and then, and then I guess that's also sort of happening in B as well, right? Because there's no persistence in any of these images that they're showing us. Nothing seems to take full residence, right. um, which I mean is a little bit counter. So I'm now I'm curious, like. You know what's the time lapse like when we think about uh, like those the Heifel Highway or like the blocking off right the segmentation those seem like more permanent uh, residencies <laughs> that they observe. Yeah, we only yeah. get to see those one time points for those papers, so we don't know like what what happens the day after that. I mean, those uh, Heifel sure. might just decide yeah. to 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 like degrade and they move off to do something else. So absolutely, yeah. I think this like 
puts into specific that this is a dynamic system that is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, the next paper is looking at how much, like, how HiFi can actually help liquid enter these pores. Um, mm-hmm. So they, I think they look at a bunch of pores and they assess like how much, how much of them have filled up with water. So I think these were ones that were initially exposed to air and. Then they yep. like look at them and go like, how much are these filled with water? How much are filled with water and hyphae? And yep. they they basically see seem to find that the the ones that are filled with hyphae tend to have more water in them, which kind of indicates that hyphae have this kind of role in the community of bringing moisture to places where there is no moisture. And this I think yes. is quite nicely shown in in D where you've got D E and F both kind of sh- tend to show this where. Um, you've got this like water channel that's forming along the length of this hypha, and they even show it in graph mm-hmm. form where they've they've taken the length of length into the channel, and this like white bar is the length that the hypha has grown into the channel, and then you like yep. see the amount of liquid and air in there, and there seems like be, be like this bolus of liquid at the tip of the hyphae that comes with it. Oh no, sorry, no, that's not bolus. Yeah. A bolus of bacteria that have come come with it, right at the tip. Yes, the number of bacteria. Yeah. Well, because again, we think of the bacteria as not being able to move down just air channels, right? They need some sort of liquid channel to get down that path. And so, yeah, the hyphae bring the liquid, and then the liquid brings the bacteria. At least that's the yeah. sort of model that I think is coming from this particular analysis. Um, yeah, I mean, again, like I think to me, this is a great observation uh, that they're quantifying to show us like what's going on in this system. But at the back of your head, you have to also remember what I was saying. Like, this is PDMS. Yeah. Right? Like, soil is going to have like a moisture, like a surface that has very different <laughs> uh, properties on it. So, like, I'm not, I don't, I think it's true that hyphae can bring moisture into places. The question is, how important is it in the environment? Right. And like, what is that role actually? Um, because like you can already, you already think of hyphae being covered in bacteria. Mm. I, I guess I already do, right? I think of everything as being covered in bacteria, right? And so like hyphae moving down a, a, a path, of course, is going to bring its microbiota with it <laughs> as it moves through. Um, yeah. So like, I guess like those are some more complex questions that we can't get to here and we don't know how it relates still to the actual soil environment, right? This is still a very, this is an artificial, this is is an interesting description of an artificial system that might model something in soil, but the jury's still out, right? (laughs) Right. Uh, And the next figure is uh, figure four, which kind of also illustrates a very very similar thing. Uh, I think they're they're more looking at the diversity of of like organisms that come along with the hypha. Uh, let me see if yeah yeah. Uh, so let me see if I can find my notes on this. Uh, yeah, because dispersal extended to the chip. It, once again, they're just looking how far they got down, <laughs> right? Um, and of course, like as you go further, oh, this is over time though, right? Right. As time goes on, as time goes on, more liquid gets dispersed throughout the chip, <clears throat> and that is presumably if we're like being inspired by the last figure that we looked at, right? That's coming with the hyphae is what we're thinking is the hyphae is bringing more moisture into the chip and that brings along with it a bunch of bacteria. Uh, And then if you look at, uh, if you look at, yeah, B, I think is they're trying to really strongly make this case because they're segregating the passages by hyphae or no hyphae. (laughs) Right. Right. And uh, uh, you can see that if in the hyphae case, there are, more quickly seeing the accumulation of things, uh, well, liquid, I guess, bacteria and protists, than in when there's when there's none. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, they they definitely do start to see that, and then like at day twenty eight, they start they waterlog stuff to try and yeah. uh, show things uh, better. Um, or I also sense that when they waterlogged it, they were also trying to kind of test out a potential experimental perturbation, right? Where they're like, is this a system of waterlogged soil? If we like waterlog it and let it dry out, like will we see something that we haven't seen before? Um, yeah, I feel like they're not, this This paper isn't like a systematic exploration of, of these phenomena. It's more like a, it's very experimental. It, it's very like uh, doing a bunch of different things and then trying to quantify what they've seen. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Uh, let me see what we've got next. So uh, we've got uh, bacteria being blocked by air barriers, which is a I think we've we've been talking about a bit, and this video uh, mm -hmm. shows that where there's like this big like where there's, there's some water molecules and there's some and you got like bacteria in one like droplet and no bacteria in the next because there is this big yeah. air barrier in, in between that. Um, and now we're going to uh, let's see. Uh, this is a, oh looking this is looking at the uh, the microbial succession air, but I think at different humidities. I think mm. so. It, so it kind of like shows that at I think lower humidities you get more of that the the high fall spread or actually I'm not quite sure what this shows because the uh, the figure legends were quite uh, vague. Um, but it could also just be replicates. Yeah. Right. I could also see this just being replicates. It, I think it might be just, <clears throat> but then there's this one which shows some nematode worms just w wandering through the. Yeah. You got various ones. Yeah. In in four in fourteen, you can definitely see the nematodes come in at one point. Yeah. And the rest of them, you kind of see the hyphae kind of coming up and blocking out the chamber, and you see the bacteria in them. Um. So I think this is kind of ah, just to nice. demonstrate the diversity of what's like being seen in these channels. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, this is, I think, again, like I like to see it in this format more than I do the video because it's like more helpful to see the time stamps, right, I think, yeah. and everything. Yeah, to get a sense of like what happened first versus later. Sometimes with like the video, it like loops and you're not really sure what's going on. Uh, they look cool, but like this is more informative. Mm. So it looks like in 14, it looks like in C, like there's like a, or actually in all cases, right? You see it early in A and B. It's kind of like a diagonal line where you, you get these like bubbles of air or water. Yeah. Air. They're air, air bubbles. bubbles. Yeah. <clears throat> and that. They're air bubbles that get in there. Uh, and that can, yeah, it's kind of weird actually to think that in the system, uh, just like the, forces of evaporation is driving motion and flow right because like things evaporate somewhere and then the surface tension will pull the water through right and if there's air at the if there just happens to be air at the at the entrance of that hole then an air bubble will get pulled through yeah <laughs> right the system um it's kind of interesting dynamics to think about and again these are dynamics that you can imagine them happening in soil, but when will you ever get to see it happen in soil? And that's, again, where the authors are trying to say, we can see some of these dynamics happening. So like, if you want to study something, right? Like, let's say, like, here's some wild hypothesis that like, um, right? Like it's the air bubbles that are disturbing the microbial communities, right? And they make them, they increase or lower the diversity in some way. Right, like here's a here's a model now that you can do that in, <laughs> right? You can put in a community, you could put a pre-existing community in one of these diamonds, right? And you could, uh, you do replicates, right? A whole line of diamond paths, each with the same community in them, and then you can do this experiment, and you can see how each of those communities change, find similarities. Uh, try to associate that with some of these phenomena. I think that's where the authors are brainstorming and like trying to show us all these different threads. You can take it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what? So supplementary figure five. It, this shows a, another graph about looking at time and days and looking at uh, how like how you take it something away from being sterile to non-sterile. And he, I think this shows a lot more the, like. The role that the hyphae are being in the community, where like initially the only mm -hmm. thing you see in there is the hyphae, and then eventually you get something to hyphae plus bacteria, and then an interesting thing that towards the end you get some thing, places where it's just the bacteria, so the hyphae have, have gone and left for the, and it's and you see a similar thing with the protists as well. So it's yeah. So like the hyphae. Yeah, like yeah. in in a at, at the later points you can see the hyphae only get smaller right yeah <clears throat> and and yeah. they get they essentially get colonized by bacteria and then the hyphae have created this environment that the bacteria can now live in and then they dip and they don't go they go away um mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. one what's happening there not not sure but oh yeah but this is i i think this evidence this supplementary figure five is a nice piece of data that piles on on that initial thought they were lying out to us where it's like 
the hyphae are structural as well, right, to this whole environment. Like they they help build some of these micro environments that other organisms then live in. <clears throat> yeah, and right. So another thing they wanted to look at was also the flow of particles through. So I'm, I'm I think of this as almost like a miniature river where th flowing through the soil. Yeah. And how these particles get transferred through them is quite an important thing. I think it's been good. It's been a th throughput for this whole paper. So they try to measure mm -hmm. that uh, using particle tracking. So uh, it's gonna. Mm -hmm. So this is like just what the image looks like uh, normally. Yeah. And then they use some fancy particle tracking software, which tracks like the moving particles, and it goes ahead and maps to their paths. And based on that, you, they can kind of. <laughs> map out the courses of these miniature rivers that are transiently being created in this trip in this chip yeah so we we've seen i think we've when we uh when we did like the mips <laughs> the hmm. mobile induced phase transition yeah. um that paper we kind of got to this as well and i feel a lot of the similarities between this where it's like there's something very biophysical of the way they approach this problem of soil, right? To be like, let's see the range of different motions that we can we can uh, ascribe to these artificial conditions. And then maybe those motions will help us relate things back to the soil and say, okay, this is something that, these are things that we could observe in the soil. And then let's make some hypotheses. How does that change the soil environment, right? What does that mean for a soil that has less spaces or more spaces? Um, yeah, this is a kind of like a tool that they tack on at the end, <laughs> I would say, to say, here's another measurement you can take in our system. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so uh, they end up forming like a graph uh, based on it. Uh, so let's see if I can... Hold on a minute. Uh, wait a minute, let me... Ah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, bingo. So yeah, they find find these river flows within within the chip, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, well, I, I guess we've said all we really need to do like the yeah yeah. Um, this is the quantification of it, right? Like it's like before you could see it. Like we we said it earlier, right? Like they were they were making this argument that you can see uh, particles getting deposited inside of the structure, right? And you say how. Right. Well, here's how, because like they show that like water is moving it. Here are the particles moving in flows. Right. Uh, very specific, uh, in some ways, liquid highways. Yeah. That are that. Are moving you can definitely see like mm -hmm. two major ones where some particles are flowing very fast for those particles. So 190 micrometers per second, which is like very a very small portion of a millimeter. I think like 0.1 <laughs> of a millimeter. I think that is. Uh, yeah. So, this actually reminds me of um do you you know like uh, oxbow rivers yeah <laughs> the the bend in a river and they say that so in the physics of that like because when water moves around that 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 uh that shape the flow on the outside is like more than the flow on the inside so what happens is that you get sediment deposited on the inside and rivers that bow they just continue to bow even more. And like those types of thoughts, those physical thoughts about the world apply down here as well. And essentially that's what they're showing us. They're giving us these ways of generating predictions about what's happening at this scale. We're like, okay, so you can imagine that things get windier and windier until they kind of break apart and then they become their own little, actually you get lakes. Yeah. The, the, the end point of an oxbow river is a lake right. <laughs> that gets formed. But that's those processes are happening in soil as well, and that can contribute to dynamicism. <clears throat> yeah, and so I think the last few movies are basically a summary of what has gone so far. So you, these are essentially show up towards the end of the paper in the discussion where they kind of try and do like mm -hmm. a, a, I guess... A, a final lap or a bow where they go look at this we've got passage disruption by hyphae uh the, yeah uh and no this is i i see the end as like this is like now they're going on full-on david attenborough moment, yeah. right where they like they want to now bring in all the things they've shown you and and like tell you that like when you look at this image you can tell a story <laughs> right like you can start like adding all this intent and stuff to all these things and say like like can you see this in any other way, right? <laughs> Can't our tool give you this image 
into the soil that you wouldn't have had otherwise. <laughs> that, that's, yeah. that's my feeling. And, and here it. we He's see laughing. the nematode worms in their natural habitat with parasmesia. Well, not a natural habitat. Exactly. In these kind of strange cyborg soil components that are artificially yeah, created. But that's but but that's what the authors want yeah. to buy into, right? The fact that these artificial things have some natural elements to them and thus are worth studying in some way. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, uh, and yeah, we've got other things like looking at this protest. So various protests, like you see, like this really big one digging its way through the soil, zipping around like mm -hmm. it's yeah, like oh my yeah, it's so fast. That that guy, he's he's that's really fast. Yeah, <laughs> really excited about whatever he's looking for, and <laughs> then we're contrasting them with these bacterial fungal interactions where okay, potentially a very static image where I can't really interpret much from it. And the last one is bacteria blocked by air barriers, which is a point we've we've heard a couple of times. So I'm gonna like yep. end this on the the more fun image if I can. Which is Yeah. yeah. Oh it was one of yeah, these. The... Right. Yeah, so go ahead. What do you what do you take away from this? Did they make the like cause like they're trying hard to show us how useful this object is. And like, we're not soil microbiologists, right. right? So like, we don't really have, like I've never had a burning question that I've, well, no, that's not true. I have had burning questions I want to ask about <laughs> in, in soil. Um, and, and maybe the thing that, so if I think about my burning question about soil, it's always about where do the biofilms grow, <laughs> right? Like how does the structure of soil like lend itself to certain types of regulatory pathways in, in bacteria? And the one little glimmer of information that I get from this, which actually probably already existed before, mm -hmm. and it's just been elevated by seeing this paper, is that idea that like, because the passages are small, you can get like isolation mm -hmm. between spaces that wouldn't normally happen. Um, so like, for example, like, um, like a kombucha culture, right, right is a, a type of biofilm that forms at the air liquid interface that happens a mm. lot, right, they call it like a pellicle or something like that in, in biofilm land, right, you like grow over the surface, because that's where the oxygen is. Um, I can imagine that inside of soil, you may get that type of living right along a droplet of water that has air around it, you could get that to grow and then you could have organisms uh, graze on it, you could have things poke into it and disperse that. So there's like this idea that these are some maybe uh, more relevant uh, conditions in which you would see biofilm formation. So I feel like somewhat convinced that they can do that. But again, um, I don't know. It's like they feel a complexity here. It's like not, you can't like, uh, it's harder to like drill down for me at least as my type of interest in mm. science is like it's hard to drill down into like the specifics of of what this chip is going to tell us yeah I, I kind of agree with that because this is very much like we've got this chip that allows us to see directly in the soil which is and show things that we might not necessarily ever been soil. able to see and I, yeah. I, I feel like there are some places to expand on this like I mean um, I mean firstly because this is again part of the things that I'm quite interested in is like how to keep microbes in captivity and I feel like this mm. is potentially another tool in, in that kind of arsenal but they never really take that leap to figure out if there are any un uncultural like bacteria or organisms in there so uh, I it didn't really scratch in, in the in the introduction they do speak to they speak to the fact that in cell cell interaction which is mm. like probably where I'm most interested in like in terms of this tech in in that field they have done things right where they isolate bacteria in smaller containers and they see like how does the metabolism change of a bacteria right that's like by itself versus mixed in something versus like flowed in a flow cell where the the the, the metabolites are changing constantly right and they said they're not doing that like mm. they they're really trying to they want to bridge something they kept saying they're bridging um this this uh, model in lab model to the outside world so yeah, I, I do think that it would be nice to see like more of that bridge, you know, like, like like more than just like the images, what else could they show us in this bridge? Like 
you know, some papers that do technology like this, they have an anchor story mm. in the end, right? So like, for example, like when they find a new way of making mutations in bacteria, then they'll like do a mutation, right? And they'll show how their system achieves, right? This particular recapitulation of a story that we already know. Um, and this paper, I feel like doesn't do that as much. May, I'm not sure if that's because this field doesn't have those types of stories, right? That they can replicate. But um, I do feel like I'm really curious to see where they can take it, right? What is the story that you can tell in this system? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, one of the things I'd like to see with this is almost like because there are very like sensors at this kind of scale that people could be using potentially, or like I mean, I'm mm. trying to think about like, like okay, what kind of research questions can we ask using this chip? And I can't mm -hmm. like I guess what we we done like the ver ver first version of that with like having the malt solution, the water and the air, but potentially they could look at yep. other sorts of things like, okay, fertilizers for us to start. Like we, there's a lot of like concern mm -hmm. over like making sure that we're not depleting our soil. And the question mm -hmm. is, okay, well let's talk about how do fertilizers change the way that soil re reacts? What are the first, sure. what, what are the first organisms that kind of search out for that? If I've, if I sprinkle uh, like, manure or mushroom compost what what actually how does that change the way organisms enter into it or that's kind of like yeah what i'm thinking of in, in that kind of respect like sure yeah no i think that that sounds pretty interesting i i was thinking about them as in what if you put them in different environments oh. Right? Do you get different things coming through? <laughs> right? Does does this is this some way of because um, people always uh, in river I know in river biology mm. I have a friend she does river biology they go in and they take sieves and they just like they just sieve out all the invertebrates from from a riverbed and they count them and based on the different numbers and species compositions it says something about the health of the river and how that river is doing. What if this mechanism, they can embed these chips into soil at different places, take them out and start counting the organisms that appear in there, and then again, come to some sort of understanding of the health of that system, right? Again, they don't have that database of knowledge to understand because people haven't been counting organisms using these chips, right, like in time. But if you built up that data set and you, sh and you were able to show strong associations between certain types of macro outcomes and this micro observation, maybe this would be a way to do uh, those types of surveys. <clears throat> yeah, I think that you bring up a good point. I think there's a lot of like investment in the agriculture field to try and find ways to monitor soils. And this could be mm -hmm. an interesting way to, to do that. Uh, yeah. And once again, I, I also, I don't want to make it seem like every, <laughs> I, this is the eternal battle, I think, being super psyched about science and then telling people about it is that, Often the way that I default into it is like I talk about some application, <laughs> but like there's also something to be learned just like, uh, and I was trying to allude to it earlier, right? Like something just saying like the biophysical scenarios here, right? Of like what happens at a, at a choke point versus what happens in an open space, right? Like those are also very fundamental basic questions of understanding like the dynamics of soil. Like what if you could predict I mean, this is uh, this is crazy, right? This is when people talk about like predicting the weather, right. right? Like, but what if you could predict the types of spaces, right, that would open up in soil, right? Given the composition, you could be like, this soil is going to be this much air, right? Given that we know that these organisms live in it, um, right. I feel like you know that could be something that this work is building towards as well. I don't think it is necessarily, but like, because it's such a complex question, like that building, but um. Yeah, that could be something. Soil is like a is a very alien, I think, world in my mind. Yeah, uh, I, I think yeah. that's one thing that this paper does get across that this, that soil is an alien world that we don't necessarily understand, and this has given us a window into seeing all the complexities mm -hmm. in there. And we've drawn out a very simple story, but I feel like th that's just scratching the surface. That's because like the actual there is a lot more complexity that we're seeing here, but we just don't necessarily yeah. have the right way to examine it yet. And so, yeah, yeah. The the simple story that they drew out was is the story of the hyphae, right? Hyphae somehow are builders of this ecosystem because they're able to punch through meniscus. They are able to block off things, right? That's the story that they built. But really, when I see this paper as a whole, that story is 
you already know that. I think people already know that story <laughs> ahead of time, and maybe that's actually what's drawing that. That's the anchor point actually for this paper, right? Is that like here's that thing where it's like we you know how high they are important, how uh, and and the water channels as well, right? We know that these things happen at certain scales. Here is it happening here, right? And and what we can study in this space. Um, but yeah, what about the news stories that we'll find with this tool, right? Or like the the more generalized information that might help us predict or uh, ask the next more difficult question. Um, yeah, I think that, that this this paper is interesting from that point of view because I think it has so many possibilities. Yeah, mm. I agree with that. And I think that that's a good place to, to leave this. Um, yeah, sounds good. Uh, okay, so I think uh, you join us next week for our news week where we're going to survey a whole bunch of papers, usually SARS-CoV-2 right at the beginning, uh, to try to find something to cover in detail like we did today uh, in the following week. And we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right. Science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please let us know in the comments. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, you can reach out to us over Twitter with the hashtag MicroTWJC. We both believe that peer review is a process where we can all participate in, and we hope that you've had a good time listening to us ramble about microbiology today. If you think you have something to add or found something unclear, please let it's us know. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Same here, Fox. Tune in next week for more microbiology content. Bye. Bye.